Imagine traveling from New York to London in just a couple of hours, or waking up in California and flying to China in time for lunch. Hypersonic flight could advance travel in ways we haven't seen since, well, the invention of flight itself. But flying at hypersonic speed isn't easy. It presents incredible engineering and logistical challenges. So how close are we to hypersonic travel? Before we get to hypersonic speed, we should probably really talk about supersonic speed. Basically, supersonic speed is when you're traveling faster than the speed of sound, which is something we can and frequently do. Certain military airplanes will fly above Mach 1, and the Concorde commercial plane famously flew at supersonic speeds from 1976 to 2003. Supersonic speed is really, really fast, but hypersonic speed is in a league of its own. So hypersonic means typically velocities above Mach 5, uh, or equivalently velocities above 3,800 miles per hour. Now, going at least five times faster than the speed of sound may seem crazy, but it's actually a milestone we've reached multiple times in the past. From the general public's perspective, probably the most visible example of hypersonic flight is watching a space shuttle re-enter the atmosphere. Now, okay, sure, the space shuttle reaches hypersonic speed just by falling back to Earth. But in the 1960s, NASA did achieve manned hypersonic travel through actual propulsion with an X-15 jet, setting a speed record that, while unofficial, has yet to be broken. And there's pretty good reason for that. The effects of uh, flying hypersonically in the atmosphere are catastrophic for the airplanes that we know of. Parts of the uh, uh, fuselage, they were actually charred, right? Uh, they were melted because the exterior of the aircraft was getting consumed. This is where the problem with long-duration hypersonic travel starts. When you're traveling below the speed of sound, the temperature around the aircraft stays close to the ambient temperature. But once you break the sound barrier, a shock wave is created, and the gas molecules behind the shock wave become compressed. This makes the air around the plane hot, like really, really hot. Near hypersonic speeds, it's so hot that it can damage the materials that make up the body of the airplane. Now, traditional airplanes are made of aluminum alloys that have a melting temperature of about 600 degrees Celsius, and advanced aircraft will have titanium bodies with even higher melting points. But the air around an aircraft flying at Mach 10 can reach 3,000 degrees Celsius. So how did vehicles like the Space Shuttle not burn up completely when they re-entered the atmosphere at hypersonic speeds? Historically, what we've done is we just put on a heat shield that's five, six, eight, ten times heavier than it needs to be and thicker than it needs to be because you can never be too careful. You want your, your people or your payload to get back in one piece. But those heat shields typically burn off completely during re-entry. And reapplying a heat shield for every single flight wouldn't exactly be practical or possible for hypersonic commercial travel. Different materials are needed to withstand these extreme temperatures, and researchers are exploring all kinds of options, from tantalum carbide to boron nitride nanotubes. If hypersonic speed does this kind of damage to planes, what about the people inside? Fortunately, traveling at hypersonic speeds isn't harmful, as long as it's constant. Rapid acceleration or a sudden change in direction is another story. So some simple maneuvers that can be done uh, with our liners, if you were to do the same turn at Mach 10, the accelerations that will be generating within the cabin for the passengers will be about 40 Gs, right? 40 times the gravitational acceleration, which will basically kill everybody on board. Another potential concern could be increased radiation from flying at higher altitudes, which a hypersonic jet would need to do. There's also the issue of losing cabin pressure while traveling that high up in the stratosphere, but flying commercially already comes with similar risks that airlines prepare for. Of course, none of these problems really matter if we aren't able to reach speeds of Mach 5 and above in the first place. Just because we've done it before doesn't mean it's easy to replicate. Historically, we have just strapped people to a rocket and fired them into space, but if you wanted to fly from New York to, to Los Angeles on a hypothetical hypersonic airliner, a rocket is not a very efficient way to do things. One idea is to use something called a supersonic combustion ramjet, or scramjet. A rocket has to carry the liquid oxygen it needs for combustion, making it incredibly heavy and not efficient for commercial travel. A scramjet, on the other hand, is able to use oxygen from the atmosphere to create combustion, even at hypersonic speeds. 
But the scramjet is still a work in progress. In 2015, Boeing's scramjet-equipped X-51 flew at Mach 5.1, but only for about three and a half minutes. It was also unmanned and was launched from an aircraft already in flight, which isn't exactly what we have in mind for long-duration hypersonic flight. Despite this, there is real progress being made in hypersonic engineering, just in a different kind of setting. So if you think about um, like a cruise missile flying at five times the speed of sound, that's incredibly hard to stop. And so that's what's driving a lot of the interest in the topic right now. Both China and Russia have claimed to have tested hypersonic weapons systems, and the U.S. is currently trying to catch up. And this wouldn't be the first time hypersonic research started in military applications. It was after the war, too, uh, during the development of intercontinental ballistic missiles during the uh, Eisenhower's administration, that uh, there was a lot of research uh, done in hypersonics. Uh, most of the fundamental concepts that we know today are derived from those times. Boeing is one company that's hoping to make the jump from military applications to commercial flight. Its concept for a hypersonic airliner comes after working with DARPA on a hypersonic space plane and working on the scramjet-powered X-51 with the Air Force. Boeing plans for this potential airliner to be able to travel at Mach 5, reducing your trans-Pacific commute to a measly two hours. I mean, who doesn't want to travel from New York to Los Angeles in 15 minutes, right? You know, I, every time the airlines make my seat narrower and make me have less legroom, I wish even harder that we were flying at Mach 5 and I could get to where I'm going in 15 minutes and only have to be stuck in the cattle car for that long. And that's the potential of hypersonic speed. The ability to connect to anywhere in the world in that amount of time would be an incredible achievement. It's also critical to study as we plan to explore places like Mars, because entering that planet's atmosphere would be done at hypersonic speed. The public imagination or perspective and the desire to have successful space missions, we need to do a good job of, of kind of working through these technologies and these research problems. It's aerodynamics, it's material science, it's uh, computer science for controls and electrical engineering. It, it's all of these things. That it, It's all a group that plays into this bigger whole. I see hypersonic travel similar to uh, what uh, prehistoric fish did uh, 300 million years ago when they left uh, water and they began uh, the life on land. Uh, so the conquest of uh, air and space is also a fundamental step in the evolution of humankind, similar to that one. The next step in connecting our little blue planet and eventually exploring planets outside of it might be conquering hypersonic speed. So how close are we to hypersonic travel? I think sustained hypersonic flight in a military sense, you know, in the form of say an unmanned missile or something, you might see that in the next three, four, five years. I mean, I think that'll be a, a pretty quick turnaround on that as long as the funding keeps up. So I believe that with the correct level of funding and with the enthusiasm of the population, it will not be difficult to put a two-person crew, for instance, in an aircraft and fly beyond the uh, Mach 6.7 that was achieved in the X-15 within the next 10 years. That dream of commuting around the world in a few hours, though, for now, you'll still have to deal with a long, red-eye intercontinental flight. Thanks for watching How Close Are We? And let us know in the comments what topics you want us to cover in future episodes. If you want more How Close Are We? Click here to watch our playlist. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.